Good morning and welcome on uh, this gorgeous day. So on uh, Monday of this past week, we had, uh, and then again on Tuesday in different venues, we had this guy, Dr. Christian Miller, who's the chair of the Department of Philosophy at Wake Forest, uh, speak. And he, uh, his ex- areas of expertise is in uh, ethics and sort of uh, honesty and the intersection of uh, our behavior with our values. And, and uh, Dr. Miller has all the right degrees and he, uh, uh, he writes for the Wall Street Journal and Forbes and has got a bunch of books out. And, he, and unique among philosophers, he's gotten lots of foundation grants for millions and millions of dollars for longitudinal studies and he's done all this research. And uh, I'm sure he would be uh, a little traumatized if he heard my summary of what he said, but I read his books and I listened to him speak. And basically, I I would summarize it this way. He would say that um, in spite of all the moral confusion in the world, especially in higher ed, uh, everybody agrees that honesty and uh, compassion and generosity, these are good things. They're virtues. And everybody agrees that dishonesty and, uh, and, and, and being callous and, uh, you know, being cold and not being generous, not being kind, those are, those are bad things. Those are called vices. And as a rule, most people, given a scale of one to five to judge their, their character, would say they're a four. If five is the best, they would say they're a four. And he says most people are a three. And he goes, it's not that they know they're a three and they say they're a four, they think they're a four. And uh, he goes, most people, he goes, when we control all the variables, when we put people in studies, when we, you know, replicate this, and we control for everything, uh, people are a three. They're just not a four. And uh, some people are closer to a four, some people are a two, but, you know, that's it. He said, uh, a lot depends upon motivation. As soon as you start talking about ethics and, and all of this, he goes, a whole lot depends upon why we're doing what we're doing. And he says, our motivation is very mixed and very complicated. Uh, He also noted that we have a profound ability to rationalize our behavior. That we are really, really good at thinking we're good and uh, that what we're doing only makes sense. Uh, In fact, uh, he didn't say this and I asked him about it offline and he says, yeah, I'm not gonna say anything about that. Uh, But his counterparts, those who study honesty and ethics at Harvard and at Duke in the last three months have all been busted for fabricating uh, their studies on honesty. So they have dishonest data on honesty because they're lying about it. Okay. Um, and then the last thing that I would say that sort of summarizes uh, what he says is that it changes possible. Again, this is not, this is not uh, Professor Christian Miller talking Uh, as a theologian or representing what the Bible says, just looking at the data in this intersection between ethics and and experimental psychology and philosophy, he would say character change is possible, but it's hard and it takes a long time. We can get better, we can also get worse, but it takes time and effort. And to get better generally requires suffering. Either the suffering we bring on ourselves, which we call discipline, I'm going to do these things, I'm going to not do these things, or the suffering that we go through because of life, whatever happens to us, we suffer. But, but that's an opportunity not to become bitter. There's an opportunity there. It's an inflection point. We can become better. So um, I share all that because today in Exodus chapter 4, we have a chance to watch uh, Moses' interaction, and to get a little bit of a case study on Moses' character and honesty. And uh, this is, I don't know, the sixth or seventh sermon in the series. So uh, we're in Exodus 4, so I'll just remind you, uh, it's the second book. And so in the first book, it, it opens Genesis 1 through 3, the foundation of everything. You cannot understand the Bible if you don't understand Genesis 1 through 3. <laughs> which is creation, fall, promise. So God creates, there's a, an epic collapse, and then there's a promise made. So Genesis 4 through 11 is basically 
uh, I'm not going to say it's filler, but it's basically information that says the fall was really profound. We're really broken. Evil is running amok. So you read Genesis 4 through 11 and you go, yeah, uh, we're in trouble. And unless the promise is fulfilled by God, then we're, we're cooked. Genesis 12 on is all the unfolding about the promise. So in Genesis chapter 12, God goes to Abraham and he says, Abraham, if you follow me, I'm going to fulfill the promise through you and your descendants. Your descendants, the Jews. So he says, I'm going to give you land, I'm going to give you descendants, I'm going to fulfill the promise through you if you do what I say. Abraham responds. And the rest of the Old Testament is tracking the development of the promise being worked out through God's people, the Jews. So uh, the, the rest of the book of, of Genesis just basically gets us to where Abraham's descendants, so there's a lot of, a lot of noise, a lot of drama, but eventually Abraham has, has an heir, and then you know, they start to multiply. But by the end of the book of Genesis, the, the people of God have to leave the land of God, the promised land, and go to Egypt because there's a famine. Then we fast forward 400 years and the book of Exodus opens and in Exodus chapter one, we see that the people of God have grown in numbers but they now threaten the the Egyptians and so they've been forced into slavery and not only that but there is this, uh, there's this genocidal edict that has been passed down that all the little baby boys, uh, Jewish boys are to be thrown into the Nile. And then in Exodus chapter 2, we see that God and his provision through, through three different women, initially Jochebed, Moses' mom, Miriam, his sister, and then a Pharaoh's daughter. Moses is kept alive in spite of this order that he be put to death. And then we get a few stories about Moses in Exodus chapter 2, which basically ends up with him after 40 years as a prince of Egypt, 40 years in the courts of power, he has to flee Egypt. And he goes to Midian, where he ends up working as a shepherd uh, and spends the next 40 years traipsing around in the desert. And then we get to Exodus 3, which is where we've been the last couple of weeks. And in Exodus chapter 3, uh, the first thing that happens is that God speaks to Moses. He is, uh, he is uh, manifesting himself uh, in, in a burning bush. And he says to Moses, okay, it's time, uh, game time. You need to go in and you need to secure the release of the Jews out of Egypt and uh, take them to the promised land. And uh, Moses will then offer five excuses as to why he doesn't want to do this. He asks five questions, but they're sort of designed as objections. And the first one is basically to say, why do you think I'm qualified? I'm not qualified. And God doesn't refute that. He just says, I will be with you. And then Moses says, well, I don't really know who you are. And God says, and this was last week, I am who I am, right? So he gives, he reveals something of his character by giving to Moses the promised or the, the, the name, the covenantal name of God. All the rest of the time we've been getting titles about God. He gets the name, Yahweh, I am who I am. And I said last week, this is God saying, Moses, uh, I will be who I will be. I am God. I am not who you want me to be. I'm not going to be manipulated by you. I'm in charge. I define reality. I make the rules. I am who I am, not who you try to make me. I will be who I will be. So now we get uh, to Exodus chapter 4. So as we are uh, reading through the last part, I'm summarizing the last part of Exodus chapter 3. Uh, we see that God grows a little bit uh, angry with Moses. We're told that God is slow to anger. Yes, he is incredibly patient, but he does get angry. Not like you or me, doesn't lose his cool, uh, doesn't become all emotional, but, but there is a limit to God's patience, and we see that God's patience are being uh, pressed. And then uh, they decide uh, that they're going to settle on uh, some help for um, they're going to settle on some help for Moses, and that's going to be in Aaron. Um, there's, there's a handful of things that are going to happen at the end of Exodus chapter 3. Um, I'm going to read now, starting with Exodus chapter 4, verse 1. 
So Moses answered, what if uh, they don't believe me or listen to me and say, the Lord did not appear to you? So this is the third objection, the third question that he asks by way of saying, I, I don't want to do this. And he just basically says, uh, you know, I'm, they, may not, they may not believe me. When I go and say, burning bush, you know, I talked with God and he told me to get you out of Egypt. And God doesn't necessarily uh, counter that. Um, he, uh, he doesn't say anything about that. He just says, um, uh, look, uh, I'm going to give you some signs. And then verse 2, the Lord said to him, what's in your hand? A staff, he replied. The Lord said, uh, throw it on the ground. So Moses threw it on the ground, and it became a snake, and he ran from it. So Moses has been in the desert. He knows snakes. If he's running from it, reasons to believe it's not a friendly snake. It's a poisonous snake. And uh, so he, he doesn't want anything to do with this. I, I'll just say, I, I get it. Um, what, been a long time since I was a little boy and thought finding snakes was a fun thing to do after school. Uh, it's been a long time since our boys had snakes, but, you know, we had three boys, so we went through the, you know, let's have a snake as a pet, uh, find a snake in the yard, keep it in a Folgers coffee can in the garage for a while. Um, but uh, we're past that, and I don't, I'm not fond of snakes. So, as a matter of fact, a couple months ago, I was running through the open lands, and I just about stepped on a snake, and uh, I didn't see it until I was about to step on it. I was actually very impressed with how high I jumped. <laughs> so I don't, I don't like snakes. I don't blame Moses for not liking snakes. Uh, Moses threw it on the ground, it became a snake, and he ran from it. Then the Lord said to him, reach out your hand and take it by the tail. Now, even I know you don't pick up a snake by the tail because then it can just turn around and bite you. You got to pick it up right behind the head. Uh, Moses knows this. The passage, the Hebrew says, God says to Moses, uh, grasp it firmly. And what the text says, Moses snatched at it, right? So he's obviously running around trying to figure out how he's going to pick up this poisonous snake. Uh, but as soon as he did, uh, Moses reached out and took hold of the snake uh, it turned back into a staff in his hand. This, said the Lord, is so that they may believe that the Lord, the God of the fathers, uh, the, God of Abra the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob has appeared to you. Then the Lord said, uh, put your hand inside your cloak. So Moses put his hand into his cloak, and when he took it out, the skin was leprous. It had become as white as snow. Leprosy, big, huge problem. Uh, back then, so Miriam, Moses' sister, we're going to read in Numbers that she gets leprosy. Uh, King Uzziah, we read in 2 Chronicles, he gets leprosy. This is sort of a ostracization and death sentence. And uh, so this is bad. Uh, by the way, let me just note in the margins here that if you've not read or recently read uh, Philip Yancey and uh, Paul Brand's book uh, on Dr. Brand, working for 30 or 40 years in India with lepers, you ought to read it again. Uh, they wrote three books. And let me also mention while I'm here, please don't email me and ask me for the name of the book. I will say, again, my notes, including stuff I don't have time to preach, including footnotes, including all that, is always online every Sunday afternoon. You can go online and read everything, including all three of the books uh, that are mentioned by Yancey and Brand. So, uh, now, it says, now put your hand back into your cloak, um, God said. So Moses put his hand back into his cloak, and when he took it out, it was restored like the rest of his flesh. Then the Lord said, if they do not believe you or pay attention to the first sign, they may believe the second. But if they do not believe uh, these two signs or listen to you, take some water from the Nile and pour it on dry ground. The water you take from the river will become blood on the ground. So Moses is going to have to take this by faith because he's not anywhere close to the Nile, so he can't recreate this. But it's worth noting that both of these things, snakes and the Nile, sort of are, are real shots right at Pharaoh. So the Egyptians were into snakes. If you see the, if you remember the, the, uh, the, the picture that we have, the gold sarcophagus of, of King Tut, 
they, he has cobras coming out of his, of his crown. They were very much sort of a satanic worship kind of thing and, and other things, but they were very into snakes. And the Nile was the lifeblood of Egypt. So he's going right after, right, the power supply that Pharaoh thinks. He's got this connection to snakes and the Nile River. Verse 10, Moses said to the Lord, pardon your servant, Lord, uh, but I have never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since you have spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and tongue. So this is objection number four. Like, you need, you need a spokesman, that's not me, uh, in, in uh, defense of uh, Moses. We've seen him in three different settings, and the, the first... The first and the third sort of depended upon his physical intimidation tactics, like he beats up the Egyptian taskmaster, kills him. And, uh, and, the, and, uh, and then in the third, he's going to have this interaction with a bunch of sort of uh, unruly shepherds who are trying to force their way to the front of the line and take the water that these, that these sisters had drawn. And he is going to somehow intimidate them and get them to back over. So... He apparently will win the cage match. He's, he's got some physical presence to him. The one time he tried to reason his way with somebody, he speaks to one of the Hebrew slaves who's beating up another Hebrew slave, and he tries to reason with him. That does not go well. So, uh, in fairness to Moses, he's not much of a spokesman based on that limited data pool, but God does not need Moses' competence. Like, let's just recognize that. As a matter of fact, in repeated instances throughout the Bible, God seems to delight to use the least qualified people to do something. He uses the last. He uses the people others have overlooked. He uses people that are not supposedly qualified. He he has armies downsize themselves so that no one will say, oh, well, of course they won, or of course this happened, because look at who they have. The, the, the goal seems to be to say, huh, how did that happen? That doesn't make any sense. So it's the old, if you see a turtle on a, po- on a fence post, you know the turtle didn't get there on his own. Somebody had to put the turtle on the fence post. So um, God says, look, you know, the fact that you're not eloquent is not important. Verse 11, the Lord said to him, who gave human beings their mouths? Who, who makes them deaf or mute? Who gives them sight? Uh, sight or makes them blind, is it not the Lord? Now go, I will help you speak, and I will teach you what to say. So then we get to verse 13, and this is the, the real reason. But Moses said, pardon your servant, Lord, please send someone else. Okay, so we've had four objections that he thought were, you know, reasonable. Now he's saying, you know, <laughs> I don't want to do this. Can you find anybody else to do this? And in, in defense of Moses, this is the only sane response to this, uh, to this leadership challenge. Egypt is the superpower. Egypt, the, the Pharaoh is a bad guy. He's having babies thrown into the river, right? They worship snakes. It's a rough culture. Uh, it doesn't live up to any of the kind of moral, ethical guidelines. It's a slave oppressing culture. It's very bad. And Moses is like, I'm a shepherd. I'm going to go walking up to this guy. Like, I'm going to be dead before lunchtime. I do not want to do this. And then imagine I get him out. I've got all these people. They've been slaves. they got no leadership training. There's no structure. I'm going to have them in the desert. Like, everything about this is a disaster, and he does not want to do it. So uh, that's where we end. Now, there's, there's... more that's going to happen in Exodus chapter 4 that, that is worth paying attention to. As I said, Moses and God are going to agree that, uh, that Aaron is going to be Moses' spokesman. Aaron is already on his way, uh, probably because the Pharaoh that, that, Moses, that had ordered the death of Moses has probably died, and Aaron's coming out to tell him that. Uh, this, if you've been reading through the Bible and paying attention and reading it like a story, you know, oh, this isn't going to end well because every time we've seen brothers, they have not gotten along. Cain and Abel, 
uh, Isaac and Ishmael, Jacob and Esau, Joseph and his brothers. Having brothers work together is not really proving to be uh, something that's happening in the Bible. And indeed, this will prove problematic. Uh, the, 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 I, the, the fact that Aaron comes on board, Aaron's going to be the one that's going to turn all the gold into a golden calf. And Aaron and uh, his sons, Nadab and Abihu, are going to have problems and they're gonna, their life is going to end early. So there is going to be problems here. Moses' hesitancy is going to cause problems for Moses and problems for the Jews so we're, we're in a little bit of a second best realm here. Um, there's other things that are going on. Uh, again, as I said, we're seeing uh, in the last part of Exodus chapter 4, we see that God's anger starts to grow against Moses. We're going to see that, that Moses, God is going to say to Moses he needs to go right now and speak to the, Israel, the Israelite leaders and that they're going to do what he says. And in fact, that happens. There's a number of things that are going to happen. God's going to harden Pharaoh's heart. There's more happening here, including the really weird part of Exodus 4 where they're, they're heading out to go back to Egypt and God almost kills Moses because Moses' son isn't circumcised and Zephorah, Moses' wife, is going to have to intercede and uh, circumcise their son and then she touches the foreskin of, of the child to Moses' feet and he's a calls him a bridegroom of blood. There's more than I can unpack today. So let me just say, I'm taking that on, that on in some future sermons and that specific issue about the whole bridegroom of blood thing. In the podcast, I'm gonna, you've been sending in your questions on Exodus. I've got about 20 now. So I'm going to try and answer those in the, in the podcast. I want us to think about the whole topic of excuses, because I think that is where we need to focus our attention. And uh, I just want to say that uh, excuses are uh, a big topic in and of themselves, and we do well to sort of pause and use Moses and this little case study with Moses and his interaction with God to think about our own interaction with God. By the time we become adults, we're pretty good at making excuses. And there's, there's just a whole number of things that happen. We don't always even think of them as excuses. We think of them as justification. But we say things like, um, I'm too busy, not my job, not my gifts. I'm too old, I'm too young, right? I'm too whatever, can't do it. And general social protocol means that if somebody throws out one of those excuses, you, you got to back up. Uh, it's, it's hard to speak to someone and to say, you're not too old. In fact, you're not too busy. You're not too whatever. You need to do this. Uh, but that just is, we're, that's not generally the way things happen. So I will just ask you from this safe distance, <laughs> I'll ask all of you at the same time, what are your excuses? And I will just say, please understand that um, there's, there's a couple different ways excuses work. Some excuses you know are excuses. Like, if you say, I can't turn in my homework because the dog ate it, you know that's not true, and the teacher knows that's not true, and you're just going to sort of have to figure out what the, what's going to happen next. There are excuses that you make that you know are not true at the time that you make them. And again, if we, if we read through the Bible, we see everybody is making excuses. Adam, Eve, Abraham, Moses, Aaron, David, Isaiah, Jeremiah. I mean, we can just go down the list. Everybody's throwing out excuses as to why they can't do the right thing thing. The first thing I want you to understand is there are excuses that you know are excuses. I'm not really as worried about that as I am about the excuses that you actually feel pretty good about. To go back to this Christian Miller data, there are excuses that you tell to yourself and you believe 
But others would look on and say, oh, no, that's an excuse. Like, that, that, that doesn't hold up. Now, I want to be really clear here uh, that talking about you raising your game, seeing your own soul, deciding you're going to work harder, all of that, that is not the gospel. Okay, so I want to pause and say, when we're reading through Exodus, every week I've been saying, the book of Exodus is a big arrow pointing ahead to Jesus. Jesus is the true and better Israel. Jesus is the true and better Moses. Jesus is the true and better firstborn. Part of what happens in in Exodus chapter 4 is that God refers to Israel as his firstborn son. I am going to intercede because of their suffering. This is my firstborn. He's talking about the Jews. Later in the Gospels, he will use the word firstborn to talk about Jesus. And he will say, I called my son out of Egypt. Right? There's all these parallels that are going on. Christianity is not ultimately this I do. It's not you trying harder to be better. It's not you working to, to be better so that you do enough good to counterbalance the bad so that God is pleased and you get into heaven. Okay, that's religion. Christianity stands in opposition to that wherever it shows up. And whereas you have all these other religious leaders, Muhammad and Confucius and Buddha, they would all point to a a, a set of teachings or a set of rules or they would point to a practice that you need to do in order to raise your game. Christianity says, nope, Jesus doesn't point to the rules, he points to himself. I am the promised fulfillment, I am the savior, it's all about me, you need to follow me, you need to embrace me. And, and, and there is, the, the gospel is the good news that when we come to Christ, right, that, that he dies in our place, our moral debt goes to him, his righteousness comes to us. So I want you to understand that. There will be, coming in this series, in, in uh, I guess, 16 chapters, we will get to Exodus chapter 20, where we get the Ten Commandments. There's going to be the law. Jesus, in fact, or Moses is going to bring down from the mountains the law, and, and the, the Ten Commandments and all the ethical guidelines that are going to follow are going to be something that are given to us, and Jesus is going to comment on them. There are rules to the Christian faith. But understand what's going on here. Part of the reason that God is going to give the Jews these rules is because uh, he needs to keep them moving forward for hundreds and hundreds and over a thousand years. And most countries and cultures don't last that long. They just don't. Right? They break down for all kinds of reasons. But, but God has said it's through Abraham and his descendants, the Jews, that I'm going to deliver the promised one, the Messiah. And so they gotta, they got to hold it together. And so some of the laws that you see being given to the Jews are, are to keep them healthy as a culture. Some of the laws that are given to the Jews are to try and curtail evil. Part of the purpose of the law, and this is what we see with Jesus, when he preaches on the Ten Commandments, we call that the Sermon on the Mount. When Jesus gives the Sermon on the Mount, he's using the Ten Commandments, and he is raising the bar. He said, by the way, it's not just that your actions have to uphold this, it's that your heart does. It's not just that you can't murder anybody, you can't get, you get that angry at them. It's not just that, that, that you, you can't uh, commit adultery with somebody in a physical activity, you can't do that in your mind. And when, when you understand the Ten Commandments, when you understand the bar where it's set, you go, oh, yeah, I can't keep that. And, and so part of the purpose of the law is so that we recognize our need for a savior. Okay? So I want to be really clear when I talk with you about, you know, excuses and trying harder, <laughs> that that's only part of the story. And the good news, the gospel is that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And everything that needs to happen for your sins to be forgiven and for you to become a child of God and gain eternal life has been done by Jesus. 
But in order to grow as a Christ follower, in order to see your character develop, in order to become better, right? That's activity you have to engage in. And we don't do it alone. Our sanctification is a partnership between God and us. Spirit-driven work. And it's hard, but it is expected. And part of what we have to do in order to get better is we have to see through our own excuses. But we have to recognize what's actually going on. So the topic of excuses, if we look at this from the standpoint of psychology or therapy or, you know, whatever, if we come at this, it, it's, it's huge and big and it goes in a lot of different directions. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to summarize a whole lot and just say that, that there's excuses that, that, that you're making about why you're not more zealously pursuing God or why you're doing things that, that, are, that, are, that are diluting your energy and your love for God. There, there are excuses that you make, and you know they're excuses. Okay? we got to deal with that. But I just want to say, the, the, perhaps the bigger problem is, there are all these excuses that we make, and we don't think they're excuses. We just think it's reality. Like, that's just the way it is. I'm just calling it the way it is. So, psychologists call these defense mechanisms, and they say we protect ourselves from a clear understanding of who we are and what's going on. Now, part of my job is to help you understand who you are and what's going on. Uh, when I was working as a management consultant, I had that in a little bit different capacity. And maybe it's helpful to hear what would happen there because I would go into a, whatever, a company or a department, and you got to figure out what is it that they really do and what's their systems and how do these things work. And then you, once you sort of break it down, you go, oh, I've seen that in this other company. Like, all these companies do something alike, like that. And then you, well, you shop around to find who does this better than anyone else, right? Who does this faster or better or cheaper or whatever. You try and figure that out. Because companies, they don't hide that. Generally, they brag about it. Like, we can do this and we can deliver a pizza in 30 minutes or less. We can do this in, you know, this much time. We only spend this much money, you know, closing our books. Whatever it is that they do. And you go, oh, they're doing this over there and they're doing it in this, in this, this fast. So you take it back and you go, look, takes you I had a client, they used to put on big conferences, and then they would publish. This is obviously way long time ago. This would not happen today. But they would physically publish all the presentations that were made, and these would be sold in their industry. And it would take them nine months from the conference to get the books printed and ready to sell. And we discovered, I discovered, somebody that was doing it in two months. I went in, and I said, Look, it's taking nine months. They're doing it in two months. we got to figure out how to do it in two months. And what would always happen when I would come in with this great data to say we can get better is everybody would get really, really mad. And they would tell me I was an idiot and a liar, and they would chase me out. I almost, one client was a, a librarian, a university librarians who were trying to merge three libraries together, and... There was one meeting I actually thought, oh, I'm going to die because librarians are going to tear me apart. Like, they are so mad at what I'm telling them that I actually started to look for the door. Like, okay, i got to be sure I, I can get out the door if somebody comes, you know, to, to crash the stage. So, so you make these presentations. You tell people, this is what's actually going on. Here's the data. And people say, no. And you hope that you're going to find a few people that will look at the data and start saying, well, maybe we could do it, and maybe we can't go from nine months to two months, but maybe we could get to four months. Maybe if we did this, we did this, whatever. And then they start to figure out their problem. So that's with companies, <laughs> with individuals. Some people never move. Some people can't see it. So... 
what are your excuses? What are you saying to yourself about why you're in the situations that you're in and you believe, yeah, no, this is just the way it is. I'm not, I'm not making excuses. I'm just, I'm just defining reality. And you go, no, actually, that's not what's happening. So I said I do it. I do this as a pastor. I did this as a management consultant. Far and away, the hardest place I've got to do it is personally. Right, is to say, what are my excuses? What are my blind spots? What am I not seeing that other people can see? So we get a chance to listen in to Moses as he's going through this, right? And, and he has five objections. <laughs> right? I can't do this. Five reasons he thinks he can't do what God is telling him to do. So um, I just want to say, look, we all have excuses there's never a valid excuse to justify sin. If you want to grow, you're going to have to get some clarity about the excuses that are in front of you. And then you've got to do the internal work to actually own them and start to move forward. So, the last thing I'll leave you with is this. This is all hard work. Uh, it's all disruptive and hard work, but there are wins <laughs> that come with getting past your excuses and having better character. Like, life works better when you're not making excuses and you have godly character. So, godly character, the character of Jesus, the, the fruit of the Spirit, if, if your life was more characterized by love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, and self-control, like that's a better life. So in order to get there, you got to work at it. And one of the first things that has to happen is you have to see the kinds of objections that you are making to why you are where you are, and it's not your fault. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are the true and better uh, Abraham who left his father's home in order to go to a strange land in order to fulfill the promise to, to rescue people. We thank you. You are a rescuer. We thank you that you're the true and better Israel. You're the true and better Moses. You're, we thank you for who you are and what you did for us. We confess that uh, we make excuses that we know are excuses, and we make excuses that we don't see as excuses. And we want uh, a little bit more insight and clarity that we could become more like Christ. Pray this in Jesus' name.